then try the experiment on, on your wife, right? And then see <laughs> through yourself. <laughs> Let's just try it on somebody else and see how this goes. I've got my personalized guinea pig. <laughs> willing, in, uh, willing, in the like no IRB required. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> She's signed the consent form to, to eat the eggs. <laughs> so much the learning is done through that human, uh, you know, biohacking and, and, and hacking and learning. And we've come a long way in the last five years and um, in low carb oh, world, yeah. but I suppose I wanted to document where I think we could keep going and learning and refining and taking, I suppose low carb has been so amazing for us and, and, but there's so many limitations and challenges and, and opportunities to take it, keep taking it forward. So yeah, that, that was what the book was about. And thanks for support with that. And um, we'll talk about that a, that a wonderful book. nutrient density and, and yeah, how to go take back it through it again. World. You know, the first read was like, yeah, cause it really confirmed Marty, a lot of what I've seen clinically, I mean, nutrient density is uh, where it's at. Yeah, 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 I love that. Um, I want to want to pick your brains later on how and we can. I referenced get it out your work world. highly when Eat Lancet. I think I first started sharing your work yeah. when that Eat Lancet report came out. Uh, was that two years? Almost two years ago, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, maybe. maybe or was it last? Oh, yeah, yeah, last maybe last January. Yeah. Yeah, it could have been longer than that. But like they're arguing for this planetary diet, which, you know, you had documented was was highly nutrient insufficient. <laughs> you know, so this was not, you know, if we're looking at creating healthy humans, this is not the way to go. This is, this is the uh and I basically you know, like how much there's like the amount of meat a week was like the size of a you know this it's a wine cork or something. You yeah, know? that was how much meat you were supposed to eat in the yeah, entire week. Day. And it was basically the the modern processed diet of uh, you know, big food, big agriculture, rebranded with yeah, greenwashing. Really, really and, and, those, those yeah, and it was all funded by those guys. So yeah, yeah it's it was like insane. Yeah, um, yeah, but um, so to introduce people to Mark who don't know about Mark, you're you're um, how many how many marathons did you say you'd done? About one hundred. About one hundred and twenty or something. <laughs> That's just a, a side gig, <laughs> running these things. So, so you know a bit, know a bit about running, and um, and you you train other people and guide other people in optimizing their nutrition and running and uh, metabolism. And I suppose I wanted to dive into that. Um, you're a professor, you're a doctor, you're involved in uh, running a hospital over there, and and running a shoe store just to you know you learn a lot <laughs> about your feet. And how to not ruin your feet after 120 marathons, and you're trying to share that. So, and you, you have fun. You just don't take yourself too seriously. So that's what I love most yeah, about it's it. It's all about play and fun, right? None of us take, yeah. you know, the people take their food too serious. They're going to crash, yeah. right? Gonna, <laughs> food is joy. Eating is joy. Yeah, totally, yeah, totally, totally. And that's what I'm trying to learn as I, you know, get this out there. I want to just have fun doing it. And you know, if people listen, that that's fantastic. I've got something really passionate about to share but um if people listen they listen and if i have fun doing it more people will listen so that's really cool but um one topic in uh, maybe diving a little bit deep but uh, you know one topic that's key to the whole big fat keto lies and data driven fasting is is oxidative priority um and just that concept that we tend to burn like the 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 um, alcohol and then the ketones and then the carbs and maybe excess protein and then the fat in our diet and then our body fat and I suppose that's what most people want to burn um, and they get confused about eating fat to burn fat and you know it's just interesting I've found it really fascinating to think in terms of different fuel tanks and if you fill up those upstream fuel tanks and I think that's where the low carb diet is amazing is, is it drops that carbohydrate fuel tank so you can hack into your your mm -hmm. fat fuel tank but often people are overdoing the fat fuel tank and thinking they have to eat more fat to burn body fat and they don't burn the body fat they want so um <laughs> yeah which i've a lot of i don't know if you run 120 marathons you probably don't need to worry about eating that much fat but uh, yeah a lot of people fall into that after a while where they just go fat to free food and i can have a whole lot of it but um yeah, it's definitely not true. Yeah. And uh, 
But that is a good framework, you know, and I think the basic framework, and Eric Westman has shared this, you know, if you eat carbs, you burn carbs. If you eat fat, you burn fat. Yeah. And then the second question is, do you want to burn the fat you eat or the <laughs> fat on your belly? So calories do count. And uh, so I'm not trying to lose weight. So, but I, I have uh, Modi type diabetes. So I, yeah. my C-peptide was 0. 0.3 like eight years ago. So, you know, I'm very carb intolerant, but highly insulin sensitive. So I need, like, I can't, I have a banana, my sugar goes to 200 yeah. and then, you know, I might crash in three. So that's not a good way to go for no. me personally, but it might work for a yeah. college runner who's, you know, carbohydrate tolerant and makes adequate insulin. But, you know, so if you overeat fat, you're going to burn the fat in that food. But yeah. if you eat enough fat to keep that insulin level low mm. to create satiety, mm. Yeah, then you can start to have beta oxidation, you know, then you'd start to use your own body fat as yeah. fuel. And I think most of that, Marty, comes from just that spontaneous appetite suppression yeah. that happens. And they have to be somewhat aware that, you know, fat's not a, whenever I hear, and, you know, that's why programs like Weight Watchers should be, you know, banned by the FTC. Whenever you tell someone there's free food, yeah, right, they're all food. I mean, people have food addiction, you know, yeah. it's, it's the brain is the captain of the yeah. ship. And if you tell someone who's had an issue with food, that's really a primary reason a lot of these people are obese. They're overeating fat, they're overeating carbs, you know, they're habit eaters and well, fat's a free food. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that that keto cheesecakes with stevia, right? <laughs> and they, you know, you're gonna, I mean, I could eat a whole one of those things and probably yeah. go back for a second. You're like, oh, yeah, yeah. it's delicious. Yeah, yeah. So, so you, you know, that, and it's a, a general entry in, you know, first we want to teach people's bodies physiologically to shift that fuel tank, yeah. not necessarily lose weight, you know, not focus on time restricted eating right away. They just need to create a metabolic shift to mm. eat fat, you burn fat, eat carbs, you burn carbs. Let's just shift mm. your metabolism first as a first goal. Don't be hungry. Yeah. Okay. How you doing? I mean, most, like I saw three people today who were yeah, pretty right. early in, like five, six weeks in to this and uh three of them average weight lost 17 other one had lost 19 and the other wow. lost like 14 all in the waist and that's yeah but they're they were there smiling yeah it's exciting it makes you want to go to work because and and of course they had bad days this is first five weeks in right yeah like it's not perfect mm. but they see that even being far from perfect they have hope now that they okay now a little harder lockdown don't make the same mistake twice um go on but yeah it's it's very individualized to each person yeah that's why someone like yourself you know they need they need people support groups you know yeah. to help coach them because yeah. it's online community so is really powerful and useful you just need the right information and advice and you're um and if that's something not working you got to figure out why it's not working right yeah. get someone to help you out yeah, yeah. Um, and, and just dialing back yeah, at that point, you can, once you get the satiety and, and you're not always hungry, then you can sort of fine tune and dial back the dietary fat to burn your body fat. And just because you've got uh, one thing that I've fallen prey to is, you know, just because you've got ketones doesn't mean they're coming from your body. If you can have, you know, you keep on chasing higher and higher ketones. And I don't know whether you've, yeah, yeah, you've ever tested that. that. At all. The, the, the most metabolically healthy people, even the Verda people after two or three years, they've got really rock bottom ketones as they continue to lose mm -hmm. weight and their metab metabolic health improves. And that's fascinating. And I, so, um, yeah, what were you going to say? Yeah, no, that is. I think, I mean, my own, I've got like four different ketone meters, the breaths and the, yeah. and uh, so now, I mean, I probably have about 0.4 average. Yeah. So in your oxidative priority, uh, early on, I'd be like one yep. and I haven't changed my diet, but I yep. think you're like ketones are second in oxidative priority. Yeah. You know, so once you become keto adapted, so to speak, you make that fuel in your muscles, yep. you start to utilize that fuel. Yeah. Uh, you're not chasing that. I just keep it for curiosity just to show people what a ketone meter is. But yeah, I think it's good initially just to help, like you could pee on a strip just to try to help guide people, yeah. you know, hard lockdown early. And I yep. think that helps them start to, it works, right? That's like the yeah. original Atkins did have that yeah. induction phase. I think we need to be honest with people that that is probably the optimum way to start. Yep. But if you're not mentally ready yet, you can general entry in. Yeah. 
Um, but the key, you know, I think if it motivates someone, but it's definitely, I, I rarely recommend checking ketones to patients in rural West Virginia. And, you know, they're lucky to check their sugars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep it simple. Yeah, <laughs> These definitely. people are not on like keto Facebook groups. They're like, you know, laborers, you know, yeah. working hard. These are not people of economic, you know, privilege. That's for sure. And yeah, nobody's come out and said, you know, ketones decrease officially and said, you know, optimum ketones might be valid in that first six weeks. But after that, you know, your, your metabolism either learns how to use them or you don't, you can burn fat back in the Krebs cycle and you don't, it, it, it doesn't have that emergency hack to use ketones in the same way for whatever reason. But, you know, a lot of people keep going well my ketones are dropping do i need more fat and you know i want to lose weight and it's all just confusing mm -hmm. anyway that, that that's all detailed. it confuses them but yeah it can yeah. send them down a the wrong path Not necessarily so, unless um, they have epilepsy or a condition that they need a specific ketone level definitely um, other than that most people yeah. don't need the therapeutic ketosis for the long no, time no. yeah so um something that you've taught with phil maffetone and um I've just been fascinated by people like, um, I listened to a podcast with Peter Atia with um, Inigo Sam Milan, who- uh, Yeah, he's fascinated. I would listen to that one. Oh, I, like, I oh listened to it twice. It blew my mind and it's stuff that I'd heard before, but he was he was hinting at um, Tadej who won the Tour de France and he didn't name him in the podcast because it was before the Tour de France. But he said he had this athlete that he thought was just incredible and he could just see from his- his lactate threshold that he was going to be an amazing athlete and there's all this complex testing and i'm sure you dove into mm -hmm. that um and what it comes down to is that at rest you're burning fat even though these amazing tour de france athletes and an incredible athlete have got such metabolic um capacity and the the, the mitochondria are just powerhouses um, at rest, most of the time they're burning fat and then they tap into... Yeah, RER is like 0.7. Yeah, mm -hmm. they tap into glucose only as an emergency. But these people with diabetes, obesity, you'd think they're carrying so much fat on their body. But if you look at their their um, respiratory quotient, they're burning mainly glucose because it's like that oxidative priority. It, it's stacked up in front and they have to burn off that glucose first. It's backed up in their bodies. So, yeah, I just... You know, wanted to nerd out a little bit with you, who's a guru in this. Yeah, area that, of... that uh, I mean, I wouldn't say, I mean, the San Milano, at least the name, he's the guru because he's in the lab. Yeah. But it, that was fascinating, you know, because we look at heart failure as a pump issue, right? We say it's a pump, but we have 60,000 miles of blood vessels that you need to, you know, deliver hemoglobin, mm. oxygen, and those mitochondria all need to work. But the the people that were pre-diabetic, diabetic, metabolic, their RER, meaning, you know, are they burning fat at rest or carbs at rest? Mm. They were like 1.0 at rest. Mm. So, so these people are just an energy production disaster. Yeah. They, they, they're they in an energy crisis while they're yeah. sleeping yeah. and they're so fatigued. Yeah. And so it's like, unless you correct that, you'll never fix their heart failure symptoms, which are fatigue, which is making ATP you know, and uh, Chris Froome won four Tour de yeah. France. So he was highly fat adapted. Uh, so, yep. you know, and that, and I don't know about the two, uh, the Slovakian uh, riders this year who were at the top of the podium. But yeah, Chris Froome went on a low carb diet and is mm. training, you know, then race week, he's obviously yeah. adding carbs because he's yeah. got to light up that part yeah. of the tank. Yeah, <laughs> he's yeah, got to yeah. burn some matches up up the climbs. But, you know, his, his primary, his, fat oxidation rate, meaning, you know, what pace can you be riding on the bike and still be using fat as fuel? Mm. You know, so if he's in that, you know, 90% of the race, he's using fat as fuel. And when he's climbing, he can tap into carbs. Yep. You know, he's got that, you know, that physiologic headroom, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. And he doesn't bump, he, you know, because he's still he doesn't carbs bonk. available. He's got him and he's sparing glycogen. So long. But, but these guys are burning they're eating so many, like you said, so many carbohydrates at that point that the, you know, 20,000 calories a day to fuel that and, and mainly carbohydrates in that, in that competitive stage. But yeah, like you said, Froome was doing, um, oh. yeah, they're eating a lot of fat even during the tour and they yeah. don't need what, what's the magic about being able to tap into fat as fuel. So you'd say, you know, so for example, I did a hundred mile race three weeks ago 
and I have yeah. it on my phone. It you know based on the the uh, distance. Gosh, I think I had burned fifteen thousand, sixteen thousand calories. Wow, is what is what I burned. You know, based on body weight. And I went through like, what did I have at each aid station? I think I probably had at most 1,200 to 1,500 calories mm. during the event. I had some bacon. I had a little bit of carb, mostly electrolyte. Yep. Because your body can't like eat and utilize. Like when you're exercising, you know, your what's called your splanchnic circulation is kind of shut off to deliver blood to the muscles. So if you think, well, I, I'm going to burn 16,000 calories you know, in this hundred mile race. So I've got to figure out how to get, could you imagine eating 16,000 calories, <laughs> even not running? I mean, just think about what that is. Like, say you're just sitting on your butt watching, you know, cricket or something like you do in Australia, not even running. And, and just imagine like what 16,000 calories would be. You could, it'd be the Nathan hot dog eating contest, I, I think. Especially from, from just carbohydrates, which are so yeah, just uh, they're whatever lower energy it is, density, whether it's you just blow fat up. or carbs. You, but that happens in all these endurance events, is you know, the the, the term in, in the athletes is well, my stomach went. Yeah. They're limited which by the disability. Yeah, it's highly preventable. I mean, they train for months and months and then well, I need to take in four to six hundred calories an hour, but they're exercising just a little too hard where you can't digest that. Mm. And it's just sitting in your stomach and okay, well, two, three hours of 600 calories and you're not digesting it. And pretty soon you've mm. just thrown it all up onto the trail. <laughs> or, yeah. or through the other end because your, your stomach. Just yeah, or exactly. Like, if it was loaded yeah. with, you know, some kind of glucose polymer, you know, then it's yeah. gonna, I was fascinated yeah, so about, you, with, can, with, you mentioned Chris Broom. He worked with Andrew Morton, who was the team Sky nutritionist. And he was smart as, and, and, was training them to you know train in fasted state and and low carb state and just pushing their mitochondria to to learn to burn fat and also you know racing and, and in that hyper fuel bring in the carbs and then once you bring in the carbs <coughs> you're ready to go and your mitochondria just burn them like you said like matches yeah, like but uh, yeah. yeah it's like it becomes like rocket fuel once you've um, built your, your and you keep that halfway open, you know, you, you, yeah. you, you know, you don't, if you're, he's highly insulin sensitive. So he's, you know, they call it metabolic flexibility. Mm. I think it's probably that term's overused. Now people yeah. are using it without going into the lab, uh, yeah. you know, without knowing that that's true. But they, he also took off, I think he said like 10 kilos of body yeah. weight when he went low carb and, you know, climbing up it's so cycling is all you know power, power to weight way. ratio yeah so it's like oh wow same as running distance running you know the best yeah. distance runners is power to weight you know that's why they're all super lean um because they can generate you know climb the hill with the same amount of power if they have 10 less kilos yeah. and some of that state might be even temporary you know they've got their racing season and they may be a little bit over lean yeah but then they're going to go into deep recovery mm. you know like two months of that's what the Kenyans do. They'll go after their season, which is smart, but they have long careers. They'll go back to Kenya and you'll know, fatten up for a couple of months, like <laughs> let their bodies recover. And yeah. then they'll, then they'll get into shape and they don't, they never weigh themselves. And I think one of the tragedies Marty about us and maybe even Australia athletics is, you know, people think they need to be at a weight, yeah. but if you talk to cultures, like even some of the Europeans old school yeah. is they never stepped on scales because it's really destructive hmm. to athletes to put them on a scale because wow. then they can develop eating disorders. They're focused on why I need to be this weight. So back old school is like they're either in shape or out of shape. Hmm. So if they're out of shape, they're not like cutting calories. They just get in shape. Yeah. All right. I'm just going to start training again. <laughs> right. And then they get back to racing shape. They're just, I'm out of shape. Right. And they just say that they're out of shape. Right. They know they're a little bit soft and that they're not worried about that. Yeah. So then they get in shape. Yeah, because there's a time of the year to be out of shape. Yeah, recovering. There's a time of the year to be in shape. You just cycle like a bodybuilder or whatever. Cycle it. It's not like a negative. Like I'm out of shape, beat myself up. I'm a little bit out of shape right now. I'm chilling out after doing a hundred mile run. Yeah, this takes. I don't don't do that. Like I just did that for yucks because of coronavirus. (laughs) Because no one let you do a marathon this week. (laughs) I know everything else is closed, and my friends Marty were doing this trail run. Seemed like seemed like a good idea at the time. (laughs) Black words, right? (laughs) At at mile ninety nine, you weren't quite sure. 
<laughs> no, I finished it. So it didn't even take a beer to convince me of doing this. I was like, yeah, that sounds like fun. What a great idea. So yeah, um, great you, idea. you've worked with um, Maffetone and yeah, it's, about, it's amazing. Yeah, we really smart, lovely guy, musician and a, and a metabolic expert. But um, he talked about keeping your heart rate down and other people talk about mm -hmm. keeping, you know, being able to breathe through your nose rather than having through your, nose. Out through your, through your mouth. If you're not a Kenyan runner or a hundred mile athlete or a Tour de France athlete, how do you guide people to become, to burn more fat, which is definitely a, a metabolic advantage for diabetes and heart disease and metabolic health overall? Um, through their diet and their activity and how do you, how do you guide them with, with those parameters? Yeah, and it's pretty simple. You don't need a lot of massive technology. So we know that based on this, the RER, as you say, so we, if you're burning carbs, you're producing more carbon dioxide, which, so you probably know, Marty, if you're out running, there's a certain pace where we're chatting right now. We've yeah. been like gossiping about stuff like politics or something you're having a conversation then all of a sudden someone tightens the screws a little bit and a couple of people they're breathing they're breathing hard so they've shifted to uh, carb oxidation at that point because they're producing more co2 so they've mm. got to breathe faster so if you're pretty intuitive you know that pace where you can't carry a conversation is mm. when you're shifting now you probably deal with people in business and i deal with people in work and athletics so if you're type a you know, so the people that are like type A, <laughs> this is easy, right? They don't yeah. know because they're so hard charged. These are like college athletes. That's why they're on the team. Like you tell, you know, a high level athlete to run easy. They don't know what that is, right? They're just only used to mm. hard. So yeah. those people you might need to put on a governor, like a heart rate monitor. Yeah. You know, Phil's equation is spot on. Yeah. So like 180 minus your age is a good start point I, I played with this when i was 30 years old coming back from a surgery and i just dread his stuff i was like this makes sense you know i put on this little beeping heart monitor put it at 150 yep. and i was amazed i was like oh, i'm like grandma's passing me in the park <laughs> and then four months later that's heart rate of 150 right i go a little quicker and it's beep beep yep. beep but then four months later i'm running a six minute mile at altitude wow. at a heart rate of 150 you know carrying a conversation Yep. never needing a recovery day because I was never running hard enough. You only need recovery if you beat your body up. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and if right, you deplete the, the you, you glycogen too much. Yeah, but deplete glycogen. And then you're binging because you've got driven hunger that once you deplete your glycogen, your body just goes into, you know, I need to eat now with, if you just tap into your fat stores, it's not as Yeah, you wake strong. up every day and you feel better. Like, you're yeah. like, I want to go run today. Yeah. <laughs> You know, so that's the speed part, but the nutrition part's important too. So when I first started, you know, learning Maffetone and stuff, I didn't understand the diet part as much. So, so you can deal with it just on a training pace, you know, slow yourself down, you know, just by slowing down, you increase your aerobic capacity. You know, you're building mitochondrial density, mm. you're building capillarization. So you're building the roads that deliver the hemoglobin, which offloads the oxygen and the mitochondria, which are the factories. So the more you slow down, the more you force your body mm. to use that fat oxidation just by normal physiology. But then you add in low carb on top of it. Now you're kind of forcing it a little harder, mm. you know, and you have to be willing, like say it's now, you know, December and you, okay, let me take the winter and build this fat burning engine you can't do it that's why like louise mm. burke studies i think she's australian she'll mm. show that in three weeks your performance declines on a low carb diet yep. i'm like well who cares <laughs> <It's not a three laughs> week. let's look and see this months. is like a three month it took me and i've been in the lab and I, we could share a, a couple blogs i've written on this so yeah. i've gone and tested That'd myself yeah and uh so after three or four years of you know, pretty good low carb, but I didn't have a, a CGM. So I was probably cheating on the fruit. You know, I was able to burn like 1.8 gram per minute uh, fat. Mm. So I was able to wow. run close to 90% of my VO2 max while burning fat. The, like if you took the physiology textbooks prior mm. to Steve Finney and Volex work showed that your max one. fat oxidation was one or maybe yeah. 0.8 yeah. because they didn't study this group that ate low carb. So they didn't have the other 
group. Mm. But the mm. faster study, which was a Volex study with these these endurance runners like Jeff, uh, uh, no, like Zach Bitter was in there. Um, but these guys were burning crazy amounts of fat at super like high speeds, which means mm. that you can run your race, right? You can run fast mm. using fat as fuel. And that's a nice place to be because you that part of your bad day is off the table. You know, like what can go wrong in a marathon? Like my Achilles could go bad, yeah. but bonking is not even on yeah. the table. So you don't even worry about that. Like or, or my fuel strategy risk, is, yeah, it, there's no need for a fuel strategy because I don't need any fuel. So yeah, it's plenty on board. It's, it's, like everyone's got, yeah, it's, it's plenty on board. I mean, it's like, that's huge, right? You show up at the line and okay, I got the right electrolytes for the weather. That's all you need to worry mm. about. Mm. serious that's all you need to worry about everything else will take care of itself yeah just, just by using your feel and your brain and okay i'm breathing if i can breathe through my nose i'm good right because then you're you're staying in that fat burning tank and do you still slow yourself down in a hundred mile race to make sure you're still breathing through your nose and not oh yeah 100 mile race you're basically like walk hiking yeah. jogging yeah you're always you're never at a point where your heart rate's jacked up in a hundred yeah. miles. So, so walking is really under related, uh, underrated for most people. Like they think they have to run. I was thinking about it, you know, that the, they, they talk about the, the gray zone or the junk cardio mm -hmm. where you're burning fat and carbs, I suppose at the same time, I talk about, you know, burning, uh, eating fat and carb, which is junk food and junk cardio is sort of that middle ground where you're dipping yeah, into glucose yeah. and the fat at the same time and you get really hungry and burnt out. But really the, the, the way to build your fat burning capacity is just to walk slowly potentially and just yeah, make sure you can down. breathe through your nose and, and chill out. And most of us, you know, I've been doing a lot of walking to work lately and it's great and it's very relaxing and you don't have to do more than that. You just have to put in the time to, to do that walking. And especially if you're, you're not doing marathons that that's probably enough for most people. And then I also try to build strength at the same time, but you don't mix up the two where you. Yeah. Strength training, Marty is super important mm. as you get older, mm. you know, that's sarcopenia issue. I mean, you mentioned the protein is so important. Yeah. Like I do more strength training now than I did. Yeah. at 30 just because you don't have testosterone you know or growth <laughs> hormone unless you unless you go online and you get that stuff in the bottles that's not real right you know, but i don't yeah. do that stuff but yeah so you gotta lift heavy things and get your protein as, as you get older but yeah that that what you mentioned there that gray zone is kind of what they call like chronic cardio so humans we're not designed to go out and like run 10 miles hard every day that's a huge cardiac stress mm. We're designed to kind of move easy, jog easy, and then sprint when yeah. you need to. So, and uh, Maffetone, the article that really changed my whole perception, because, you know, we don't get just like we have absolutely zero nutrition education in medical school. <laughs> we even have less on exercise physiology that, you know, it's like wow. zero. I mean, we just treat disease. But yeah, his, his article actually was Mark Allen, who won yep. six Ironman. His article was... Uh, get fast, slow down. Mm. And it was kind of Maffetone, Mark Allen. And it explained this method of, you know, you're running a 12 minute a mile at a heart rate of 150. Next month, you're running a 10 minute a mile at a heart rate of 150. You know, now you're running an eight minute a mile at a heart rate of 150. You're building like an electric battery, right? Mm. You're building this, you're, that's getting fit. Yeah. You know, how fast can you run while burning fat? Not how fast can you run? How fast can you run burning fat that means you can do that all day and that's yeah. and i was like wow that makes sense and yeah so like yeah you you become your own experiment yeah. and you do it and you're like holy cow this is yeah i think i did that. six months after doing that i showed up at a marathon in washington dc um kind of under duress i had, i was on the air force team and i told them i wasn't i wasn't in shape right because <laughs> i hadn't done all the traditional running i said i'm not in shape right i'm out of shape because I, I haven't raced or done anything and someone was hurt and they said well just come you know we need you to show up so i showed up and it was a thirty thousand person race marine corps marathon wow. and i went through halfway of that race and i'd just been running this easy heart rate stuff you know around this little park in denver you know, but it was getting pretty fit, right? Like, cause I could go pretty quick at this, this uh, low heart rate. And I went through halfway this race in like an hour and 15 minutes, which is like maybe 540-ish, 550 pace. 
per mile and the kilo and you do your conversions. Uh, but I felt like I hadn't even started running yet. <laughs> it's like this, because usually already working. I'm like, this is like a freaking jog. And then I just like turned around, headed for home and came back in like an hour and 13 minutes and finished in third place in this race. That's 30, like 28. Yeah, but it was wild about it was like, usually like, I don't know if you've done distance running, like when you finish this, you're like done, I'm done, I'm done. Yeah. I don't never want to do this again. But like you cross the line and you're like, I could go do that again. Wow. Like you, you weren't, you're was like crazy. It was like, totally different world and if you need to sprint to the finish line you've still got gas yeah. on board you've got oh, that totally like fast I was burning if you need it probably 30th place at halfway and just everyone's coming back and that's i think that's good for your brain too yeah, you're just catching up good right and yeah, you're just like yeah, yeah, yeah. there's one and you're catching up you're catching up you're catching up and that's that was my convincing that okay this works <laughs> so i like but, I, I like to to not feel dead and yeah. suffer no one likes to suffer. So how many Bostons have you done now? How many Boston marathons? I'm at 27 Boston marathons. No, this year I did it virtual. So <laughs> I did it with a friend, you know, on, around my neighborhood. And that's equal record, is it? Or is it up there with the... Uh... Oh, no, there are people who have done like 50 of them. I'm not oh, old wow. enough. I would have to, yeah, that's I'd have to age it. Like I'm only 54, so maybe if I keep going <laughs> until I'm like 90. I'm sure you'll catch them. Right. Yeah, so I suppose yeah, the, the takeaway from this... age 54, so yeah, so if I make it to 84... Do keep going. Oh, well. Yeah. Keep keep eating well and nutrient-dense. So I suppose the takeaway for people yeah. who don't want to run a marathon <laughs> is just, you know... Get... You don't need to run a marathon. Just go yeah. out, like you say, walk. If, right, yeah. you know, marathon is just kind of fun to be out there. Perfect. So going back to the nutrient density, eat Lancet thing, it's just crazy that I think that nutrition is so rarely about nutrients. It's like you look at what is recommended for to save the planet or like we were talking about before, the, the eat Lancet thing was just a rebadge. Brains and yeah. yeah, like big farmed corn or something. Yeah, rebadge yeah. free agriculture with a, a greenwashing that would then, you know, promote it more. And you look at who's sponsoring it. It's all the chemical and drug companies that have got a lot to benefit from this plant-based belief system. I'm not really against mm -hmm. eating plants and plants are incredibly nutrient. Oh yeah, I eat plants, plenty but, of plants. But the whole plant-based thing is just this, you know, fear. They're a side dish, you know, like yeah. just most the of the calories feed your microbiome you know i think yeah. the fiber has a role as robert lustig you know yeah. fiber feeds your gut yeah you know it's not for to make you poop it's to feed the microbiome there's six trillion bacteria so there's a role for that but yeah. excessive fiber you'll just yeah i mean you know, we, we don't we don't thing. we don't focus on fiber per se and say get this much no. fiber you always get plenty of fiber with nutrient dense foods and but yeah uh, plants can Avocado. definitely contain um minerals that are harder to get from just the meat if you don't eat a lot of seafood but yeah it's just crazy that the world out there is so you know micronutrient nutrient density is just not a thing so i suppose i've been trying to push it and people like you have said this is cool and this should be more of it and no, it's so important i think and i like your hypothesis you know i mean how do you but it's I, what i see clinically is is what you mentioned is you will, if you're nutrient insufficient in some way you will keep finding calories but if you know you eat human beings, eat plants and animals, that's in our DNA. So mm. if you eat a spectrum of plants and animals, mm. there's nothing you're going to be missing. Yeah. And you'll be satiated. Yeah. If there's something you're missing, you're going to keep eating. So yeah. start with nutrient density, whether yeah. it's you know, head and even protein leverage yeah. hypothesis, but I don't think it's a macro, I think it's nutrients, right? So if you're craving your too much protein and you're still missing some nutrients you're probably still gonna you know mm. there's essential fatty acid just eat real food mm. nutrient dense mm. low carbohydrate spectrum if you have mm. metabolic syndrome like mm. everyone in my clinic <laughs> if you're an elite athlete not metabolic syndrome you don't need to be specifically low carb but you should be nutrient dense then yeah. you know people adapt differently depending on the season what their goal is at what stage of the season yeah, yeah. Um, so you've had a major impact on your hospital and, you know, got sodas out and given people nutrient dense, low carb food and they've dropped the insulin while they're in hospital rather than coming out yeah. on, on more insulin. How do we, how do we make that shift towards nutrient density? If, if nutritionists should agree that 
nutrition is about nutrients. So if you start there, that yeah. seems logical to me, but Gosh. not to a lot of other people. Yeah. How, how do we take that a million dollar question. and change it? You know, when you have your allies, you know, in healthcare, all telling different messages. So for example, let's just take this. So say you have a cancer patient, you know, with a cancer that's definitely driven by hyperinsulinemia mm. and who's losing weight. And we say, well, you need to gain weight. Let's give you some boost, right? Which is 50 grams of carbs, you know, per serving. We need you to gain. So if the dietitian comes in and says, we need you to gain weight, let's give you like pancakes and syrup and boost. And they have a cancer, which is many cancers mm. that are fueled by Being hyperinsulinemia. Like yeah. It's like, wow, that's nonsensical, um, <laughs> but, but it's, it's, yeah, and most like the literature on hospitalized patients show that people leave the hospital with worse glucose control than when mm. they entered it. But Which you know, you've read Bernstein sure, backward and forward, and I just you know try to start with you know I'm not going in and saying well you need to be on a low carb diet. Let's just talk about the law of small changes. Yeah, and That's uh, brilliant. Let's like, talk about insulin so resistance. Fundamental. So fundamental. So fundamental. Let's mm. uh, you know how about this? Do you like eggs and meat and vegetables? And oh yeah. You know, what if we give you double serving of, of eggs, meat, and vegetables, and we not give you your pre-meal insulin? You know, how's that sound? Oh, that sounds pretty good, Doc. <laughs> I mean, we're not like, in, yeah, you give them a choice, and they're like, oh my gosh, that, like that was, they can't even finish it. Yeah. And they see their, their sugar is, and we cut their, you know, we've got some guidelines, Marty, on, on med reduction, mm. because if they come in mm. on 200 units of insulin, and you feed them a low carb diet, like they'll crash, right? Yeah. So, so it's a whole clinical pathway. You know, if they're going to do the 10 gram carb per meal, standard hospital diabetes diet, I mean, you know that it will give you diabetes. It's 60 grams of carbs per meal, and then they mm. get 15 grams. Like, gosh, if your wife or myself had that many mm. carbs in a day, right? It's mm. a disaster. Mm. And they're getting it at every meal. Mm. Yeah, and then they realized too, which is just, you know, goes against everything they thought was true. But as you know, it's physiology. Here they are laying in bed, you know, with some medical condition. They're not exercising, yeah. they're not sleeping well. Yeah. And their sugars are perfect. <laughs> so it's like, wait a minute. Like, <laughs> they like, should be getting worse because they're so they should be they getting should be worse. Right? Resistant. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just don't, I mean, we don't do that to like a septic patient, you know, you're treating them, but these, most people are in for an exacerbation of a chronic condition. They've got chest pain, they've got heart failure, they've got a diabetic foot ulcer, COPD exacerbation, you know, they're in for pancreatitis, you know, they're in for liver issues, they're in for some exacerbation of a chronic condition is, and those are majority of their stroke those are the insulin resistant conditions, you know, that mm. Raven described mm. 20 plus years ago, the mm. whole spectrum mm. of, of mm. hyperinsulinemia. Ben Bickman's book is great. Yeah. You know, just terrifying. <laughs> very I haven't well checked that written. one out yet. Yeah, yeah. Why we get sick. And he's a researcher, you know, so yeah. his job is to answer questions that's important. Like our job as doctors, we just go treat things, but mm. we need to listen to the researchers because we need to answer the questions and talk mm. to the people that are trying to answer the questions. Mm. So, so how do we, work both sides of it. How do we take the nutrient? Like if, if you, if you call it by a name like low carb or keto or, you know, it's, it really just needs to be nutrient focused, tailored and optimized to your goals. Um, how do we take that approach to the world or is it just, you know, grassroots more and more people find out? Yeah, about the grassroots is growing. Yeah. It's, it's bottom up, right? It's bottom up before it'll be top down. You know, the mm. U S dietary guidelines aren't budging. Mm. You know, when you look at, you know, I've been on calls and testified on the Senate floor virtually this year, mm. wow. you know, so if they're U S dietary guidelines, 55% carb, you know, that's their recommendation mm. and 80% of our country has metabolic illness, then that, you know, prudent, healthy diet is only valid for 20% of the mm. population. Mm. We just need to be honest that this is not the, so yeah, I mean, that they're the, that's the USDA, the appointed people. I don't know what their conflicts of interest are. We tried to get some people on that guideline panel, you know, who could potentially influence and they weren't accepted into the panel. I mean, so it's until, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and the yeah, they, goal every five is years, the the products of U.S. Agriculture. And, 
Exactly. And these guidelines affect like you, you're, you're not going to read them or care. You know what foods are healthy, but it affects what's served in schools, mm. served in mm. jails, served to the military. We serve chocolate milk to grade school kids, mm. you know, seven teaspoons of sugar per meal just in the milk. Yeah. Which is, yeah, like we're, how does a kid make a choice? So it drives, you know, the most economically insecure food insecure yeah it affects food stamps you know with in america food stamps are the the free food if you you know have financial need mm. you know, we call it snap and wick mm. and all these federal programs you know you can go buy fruit loops yeah with federal money it's it's nonsensical but uh, i think but the people the I number mean, one purchase it is, yeah. You can buy Mountain, in my state, it's Mountain yeah. Dew. Which is, do you have Mountain Dew there in Australia? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not making that, that up. With the, the Jew mouth, and it was horrific. Yeah, Mountain Dew. You can buy that with federal money. Yeah, it's considered a calorie, right? So you can buy that, or you can buy broccoli. <laughs> and right, yeah, so, but you, yeah, it's it, it, the whole go buy food the Mountain Dew. So, set up that it's so much cheaper to buy the because all, all the grains and oils are so heavily subsidized that nobody can afford the the, the healthy seafood and veggies and yeah but so, you know you're probably you're familiar with robert lustig's work yeah. i'm sure marty yeah. he was yeah, yeah. very early in the game and he's he's a yeah. straight shooter you know researcher clinician but he's pretty honest and you know pretty outspoken but he says you know we just got to wait for everyone to die off that's what he says, you know, the long white coat. But he said, and, and I think I, I like this because I, I see it happening. You know, you have your group, you've got, mm. I think of how many books now. There's this huge awareness, mm. you know, published, uh, just published a little low carb on a budget guide. Mm. You know, so it's the wisdom of the crowds. But he says he thinks we might be in year eight of 30. You know, if you look at any type of public health change, like sea change, look at tobacco, yeah. wearing seat belts, you know, things that like now you're like, gosh, can you believe we used to mm. let kids ride in the back seat without seat belts? You know, when I was a kid, we never used to seat belt. <laughs> you know, so yeah, I would be able to buy cigarettes myself. I was smoking in the fifth grade, you know, it was legit, right? We all yeah. got hooked. But but we're we're at about year eight. So it's just like you can't give up. Yeah. You just can't give up. You just mm -hmm. hang in there. Great. You know, scientists, you know, David Ludwig in the game, you know, Lustig, mm -hmm. you know, you've got Tim Noakes over there in South Africa, you know, Peter Bruckner over there in Australia, Bullock Finney, you got like the band of band of brothers and sisters is growing. <laughs> Yeah, and they say science progresses one death at a time. One, so, one yeah, Max Planck, <laughs> one death <laughs> at a time. And the, and the people, like, how do you, when these people are making this miraculous change, you can't dismiss it because one outlier refutes your hypothesis. Mm, mm. So if you say, well, low carb, high fat is dangerous, and you have one person mm. who just debunked that, then your hypothesis needs to be challenged. Yeah. For example, and, I mean, you think of it like this. So, so you drop a hundred apples from a tree to the ground. You know, okay, all hundred go to the ground. So there's probably something called gravity pulling. And you make a hypothesis, but say one went up <laughs> and the other 99 went down. Yeah. Then you can't say, well, it's gravity or you, you have to talk like something else is going on, yeah. right? So, I, I mean, I don't yeah. know, there's so many that the people are making it happen because the, like these people come into my clinic not all of them succeed mm. you know it's, it's, there's a lot of mind change but the yeah. ones that do which you know i feel the majority mm. they've debunked conventional wisdom mm. Mm. have to explain it so what have what have you learned over the last five years of being in you know i think you got into low carb about eight years ago with uh, eight years ago yeah brought it yeah. to the hospital then yeah. So what have you learned since then? There's, you know, there's a movement and every movement needs to continue to refine the thinking to stay relevant. And yeah. So what have, yeah, what have you gosh, learned? It's a great question because I learn every day from my <laughs> patients. Um, certainly stress is, you mm. know, and now socioeconomic stress with COVID, yeah. Yeah. food insecurity, um, support systems you know if, if everybody needs a buddy marty like if mm. you're just home and everyone around you and it's and food addiction you know joan ifflin's work is mm. fascinating, fascinating you know so 
you know, I don't have any magic on how to treat it, yet, but, but um, bringing that up front end, you know, I, I think mm. my patients can understand, you know, I'll draw the little uh, Steve Finney gas tanker truck, right? The little <laughs> diesel engine and the big petrol, you know, and you, you're, you can't access this, but that's all fine and good. But if you're carb addicted, yeah. then that's the elephant in the room. Yeah. So, I mean, the physiology, I think, is pretty clear, you know, the insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia. Mm you know, metabolic syndrome, that's been sorted out. But, you know, I think the art of it, and I learn every day just by talking with people, how can I get people to understand it? Um, one thing I think that's a game changer that I've learned more about and I utilize as much as possible is a CGM, mm. a continuous glucose monitor. Yeah. You know, and I have, I think I showed you, I have the Freestyle Libre yeah. on now. So I have an app on my phone Yep. you know, called a Libre link up yep. and I can, I'll just show you the screen so I can see, I've got about 40 patients right now wearing oh, a wow. CGM yeah. that, um, my phone here. So you can kind of like, see these sugars here. Right. So like these, and it doesn't have their last name, but so it's that t personal high touch. So, you know, I'm, I, maybe I'm an outlier, but I'm willing, like if I'm going to help someone, I'm available to them 24 seven. And if they're coming off medications, we must be available to them yeah. because like, okay, their sugar's 50. We need to cut their insulin down, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, but yeah. then they know I'm watching them, you know? So like there, I know there's the people that are struggling and I'll see kind of how they're doing. And I'm just trying to I know. Yeah. So my one friend who's been, oh yeah, he's doing better today, but, but then you can really see who's off the rails. Like if someone's like 300, 400, I'll send them a text just so they're not accusatory, you know, be like, Hey dude, what's, I see going? a little bit high today, you know, what's going to, you know, what's going on? Can I help you? And they're like, and usually it's quickly, it's like, oh, you know, you know, S, you know, when, you know, <laughs> I was watching football with some friends or, but it's like, you can't unsee it. Like when you got a CGM on and there's so many surprises, like, you know, that you, you wouldn't even imagine. Mm -hmm. Like my A1Cs were always like six to six, three range. Yep. You know, it's not, not horrible, but not perfect. And yeah. I thought I was doing things pretty well, but I would check like three to four times a day, but I would miss all this. Yeah. And I was probably still fruit addicted till I started yeah. wearing a CGM more. And then I just saw, look, I just can't eat the fruit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's, you know, watermelon and I just can't eat the stuff because you'd have all these big spikes and yeah. that you didn't see. And you're wondering, yeah. well, damn, my A1C still like not, like, why is it so, so high, you know? Especially if you've got low pancreatic function. Feed. Yeah, yeah, you don't yeah, see those be really spikes because you'll you'll correct it by the next meal, but mm. you don't see that like if you have some melon or something or some fruit at that meal, it'll go up to like 200, mm. 250 and then come back down by dinner, but you mm. just missed mm. Mm. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you wouldn't know, right? Because you don't really feel that that much because yeah. it's kind of normal yeah. in, in the way. But then once you just erase that, it just teaches, again, some people can get away with fruit. It's, yes. Some people can get away with a little cookie. Yeah. It, it helps people. And then you can also um, see what the effect of exercise is. We, we have a grant yeah. now through Freestyle or through Abbott. You know, we call it the glucose excursion model. So mm -hmm. patients are going to self-learn. We give them one of these CGMs yeah. at the onset of their diagnosis, some basic tools, but then they just log some things and they see their effect of exercise. Mm -hmm. They see what foods raise their blood sugar mm. so they're you're an engineer right they reverse engineer yeah, yeah, yeah. so i don't tell them what to do they come back in a month and say what did you learn <laughs> it's fascinating yeah yeah it's, it's fascinating Powerful. it's like what did you what did you learn i had a patient today and uh had trouble continuing his cgm for insurance issues so when he had a cgm on he was doing great he's like yeah my sugars are he's type 1 80 to 120 and then he has diabetes distress, which means that he's just overwhelmed by his diabetes. He, he couldn't get a refill of his glucose monitor. He just started checking randomly and his, his came in today and his sugar was like 400 and he had a burrito on the way to, and he's like, yeah, I just got tired. He's like, oh, I need to get that monitor because when I wore that thing, yeah. he would go eat pan Like he's so glucose intolerant. He'd have three pancakes with syrup. He'd go from 120 because when he first wore the monitor, we just like, you just go just do some normal things. And he would go from like 120 to 400 with just not even a big pancake meal. Yeah. It's like, dude, Insane. 
That's not healthy. Yeah, you, <laughs> he didn't know, right? It's like, don't he, but then he's so addicted to him. Once he didn't have that monitor on, he's like, well, maybe it's not going to do that again. But he's learning, you know, he's learning. It's, 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 it's fine. Yeah. The community support is really important. I remember when we first started learning about insulin dosing for carbs back 16 years ago, we had a GP that was willing to take a phone call or get a text and just to help you fine tune it. You can't just have a, a, a quarterly doctor's visit to refine yeah, those you things. Do that. You need constant support pretty much. And that's where the Facebook community aspects are really important, mm -hmm. really useful. And people just thrive when everybody's doing the same thing together and supporting each other. And they've been on those that path together um is that book available the low carb on a budget or you sent me a i'll send it to you it's a free it's free yeah, okay it's, so, we, we did a thorough grant and i'll give you it's a yeah, cool. tiny url link yeah you it's sent a me tiny a link. I'll, I'll share that, uh, I'll share that low carb that. any budget share it out yeah that's great that's really helpful so what else are you working yeah, on and your book is uh fascinating too you know, this <laughs> your book would be the deep read <laughs> yeah. you know after someone's kind of been playing in the space a little bit they've got to go make a few mistakes and yep. see what's working for them and it's your guide is awesome for people because everyone's going to stall somewhere yeah and they're all going to have a little bit different issues so when yeah. they read that they can okay let's attack this one variable okay, yeah. let me try to increase protein more nutrient density Okay, let me time restrict eat a little bit. Mm. Mm. You know, like just figure, don't try to change six things. Mm. They can read it and and see. Okay, if people are smart. You know, they they kind of sense. Okay, this if they're honest with themselves, though. And I, I never try to get people to change three things because then yeah. it's too much. Like, okay, what what one variable do you want to work on that you think is going to be the most powerful thing to get you back on track? Yeah, people get you know, overwhelmed. Get rid of the low carb. Yeah, get rid of those low carb desserts. Right? <laughs> you know, they go online and they're like making low carb cheesecake with stevia that has like two thousand calories per cake, and they think they're like great. You're going to burn the fat you eat or the fat on your belly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They might be burning fat, but they're burning the fat in that cheesecake. And it's not disaster. But it's well, delicious. <laughs> so, it's great. It's tasty, but yeah, yeah. It's, it's super tasty. So what else are you working on? What's happening? What's what's on the horizon? You're always yeah, so fun and my, running and my goal is to just try to get share this education. Um, we just got uh so we have in America it's it's called CME continual yep. continual continuing medical education. So the nutrition network has an amazing kind of battery of courses. That's Tim Noakes' foundation. Mm -hmm. And so I, my institution, we approved that for USA CME. So I'm sharing that out. So people like, I could share you the link. Yeah. People can like, because now people are, instead of traveling on a plane to a conference and sitting in a crowded room and listening to lectures, which probably won't happen. What do you think? Like a year? Yeah. Maybe never. <laughs> so now you could go at home, you know, have really high quality lectures, From get home. your credit hours. Mm. and try to educate you know because the metabolic illness is the, this is the pandemic yeah that we're not flattening the curve yeah you know and i've written yeah. about that and it's you know this is the full catastrophe this is the global pandemic and know, combined with not going to be a, va a vaccine yeah combined and, with they, covid it just makes everything worse so complete mess yeah it's disaster you have diabetes obesity and covid you're going to be in the icu yeah. so it's an opportunity you know, we can wait for a vaccine, you know, lock ourselves down more, but that's not the way out, right? That's mm. not the way we're going to get back to normal, you know, economic stability mm. and normal, you know, it's, it's isolation. Look at, I mean, you, you see it all over the world. There's so many downstream effects from locking people down. Mm. Yeah. Even mm. they don't come to doctors and they're missing their cancer screenings and their heart disease. Mm. And, you know, I'm, I'm not, going to make a case on either way for lockdown because <laughs> anytime you you mention anything against the standard <laughs> norm right you, yeah you put yourself out there to get your head chopped off yeah yeah yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's wear a to protect the care homes say, and people people are just sitting at home on on social media and the whole world becomes social media and that's the only thing they see and it just compounds the paranoia and crazy and it's, yeah, yeah, it's doom scrolling and all that yeah outside right yeah, I've, I've just found I've just got to back outside. off and not 
like you say, not comment because anything you say, yeah, just, just be careful, can be used against you. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you eat junk get, food. That's my nuts. message. No one can yell at me for that. I, I wear my mask. We were, we were giving away masks at my running store before people thought, oh, no, that's stupid, right? But then like no no there's no downside to wearing a mask i don't know i don't have any empirical evidence but there's no downside <laughs> and, and then now it's like everyone wants to wear a mask but it's it's all all good yeah take care of yourself stay healthy yeah stay healthy stay well nourished stay healthy get outside yeah get like, get sun get, get nutrients day. support your immune Indeed. system yeah. exactly stay, stay happy and have fun which i think you've uh, a great example I, i'll just love you know take yourself too seriously just get out there and help people and show Climb a little love and you got beautiful trails out there in australia yeah. you know, i mentioned uh, before we started recording you know i had a wonderful three months down in warrnambool doing like a locums job down there and it was in your uh the austral summer which was great because it was our winter and i so I'm gonna get out of the U.S. and go, go on the south coast of Australia. Yeah, that's great. It was it's getting, nice. it's getting really great hot food. here at the moment. It's really lovely. So yeah, yeah, we got winter coming in now. Dark. Yeah, you're, you're all rugged up with jackets. I know. I got yeah. My my little uh, pad here is chilly, but I, I keep the. I like keeping temperature cool because mm. I think it just helps. I think there there might there be another talk. I think there's some benefit to not keeping your environment kind of euthermic. Mm. Mm. You know, they have a little chilly in the winter, so your body probably adapts to that. Mitochondria wake up. Brown fat, right? That's what we want. That's active, healthy fat. Definitely. And that needs to be act, cold. Activates brown fat, yeah. which is which is uh, healthy. Yeah. The mitochondria in those brown fat get a little chilly. It's good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Crank, your, right. crank your heat. Thank you so much for your time. It's been so oh, fun. Arnie, thank you. Too. And thank you for, for coming on. And thanks for your support to everything. So. Read your book. Yeah. We'll share, you. share it out to thank you. wide audience. Yeah. We great. Really appreciate that. Looking forward to getting it out. Thanks, mate. Have I'll, a great I'll, Saturday. I'll, yeah. No, thank you so much. Have a great Friday night. Enjoy a bit more wine at the front end of the oxidative priority. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> you've earned it. <laughs> Thanks, yeah, low carb Thank is two grams per glass. It's pretty good. <laughs> That's great. Thanks, All Mark. Right. Ciao. Thank Catch you, you buddy. Bye.